Kia ora and good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. My name is Logan Williams and today I want to talk about a topic that is bigger than all of us. That topic is visual health. See, vision connects us all. It provides meaning to our lives. Just think, every single day you use vision. For that reason, I believe we should do everything in our power to provide vision to people from all walks of life. Today, here and now, I invite you to share my dream with me. A dream to make a long-lasting and meaningful difference for generations to come. If I was to ask you, what are some of the health conditions faced in the world today? Conditions such as cancer, malaria, HIV AIDS, and cardiovascular disease first come to mind. But what if I was to tell you that in fact, one of the most prominent health conditions faced in the world today is light sensitivity. In fact, extensive studies have shown that an estimated 20% of the world's population suffers from light sensitivity. To put that into perspective, that's 2.2 billion people around the world suffering and living with this condition. That is the equivalent of the population of China and the population of India combined. Just to show how prevalent light sensitivity is and how it influences all of our lives, let's do an experiment today in this presentation room. Could you please put your hand up if you've ever driven past a line of trees and been experienced a flashing effect by the light. Excellent, thank you. Could you also please put your hand up if you've ever been driving towards the setting sun and experienced sunstrike? Excellent. For those of you that are observant in the audience, you would have seen that the majority, if not 100% of the audience, put their hand up. This goes to show how light sensitivity can influence every single one of our lives. And in fact, in many of those scenarios, it can be light-threatening. After doing this initial research, I was inspired to go deeper. How can I solve light sensitivity? So I went out and I individually surveyed and interviewed 200 New Zealanders from all walks of life to gain a better understanding of how light sensitivity influences our lives. I have the utmost pleasure today to present some of their stories. Firstly, I'd like to introduce you to my good friend Emily. Emily inspired me to conduct the study in the first place. See, Emily suffers from a condition called photosensitive epilepsy, where flashing white light can cause her to have an epileptic fit. An epileptic fit is where a person's body uncontrollably shakes and convulses in pain, typically on the ground. Just imagine losing complete control of your body, unable to move as you look around and no one can help you. I'd also like to introduce you to Kim, Kim suffers to a similar condition to Emily, where bright light can cause her to have migraines and headaches. But Kim loves to take in New Zealand's landscapes. For instance, Kim loves to go skiing with her friends. But every time Kim puts on a pair of skis, she's actually taking a massive risk, as when she's skiing down the slopes, if the bright light reflects off the snow, she can get a migraine and completely lose vision. Imagine skiing down the slopes blind, that's immensely threatening to her health and well-being. When interviewing Kim, I was quite inspired because she was actually more worried about the people around her than her own health and well-being, which just goes to show how connected health is and how it influences every single one of our lives. So after conducting this survey and interview, I was inspired, and there was one considerable solution that everyone brought up, and that was the potential use of polarised sunglasses to prevent light sensitivity. This works by dampening the intensity of the light as it enters the user's vision and giving them the critical seconds they need to close their eyes or walk away. So after coming to this conclusion, I went back to these participants and I asked them, so why aren't, isn't sunglasses the perfect solution for light sensitivity? Well, it turns out there is a array of issues with this. For instance, most sunglasses designs do not cover the user's 360-degree vision, leaving the peripheral vision vulnerable. Thus, if you imagine that you're Emily and you have a flashing white light at the side of your head, that poses a major threat to your health and well-being. And also, if we look at sunglasses designs, they easily fall off and break. So imagine if you're Kim, skiing down the ski field, and the sunglasses break, off, break or fall off. Just imagine having a migraine. Again, it's life-threatening. And finally, sunglasses are also socially unacceptable, as many health and safety codes state that in many business contexts, you can't wear sunglasses in work. So seemingly, I was so close to a solution, yet so far away, until I had a eureka moment. 
Today, I'm excited to present my own unique concept to overcome light sensitivity. Introducing polar optics, polarized contact lenses for people who suffer from photosensitive epilepsy and other light sensitive conditions. So how does polar optics work? How can polarized contact lenses improve your health? Well, polar optics works by as the light enters the user's eye, it is bent and it moves the light away from the center of the user's eyes. This dampens the intensity of the light like sunglasses and gives them the critical seconds they need to move away or close their eyes, thus could potentially save their life. So to put it more simply, if you were to simply get a clear glass of water and hold it up to the sunlight on a table, you should be able to see the light cast into the glass and be bent at an angle. This goes to show how light can be refracted and dampens the intensity of the light. You should be able to see a rainbow be cast on the table. This shows how the light is bent into the different colors. So why polar optics over sunglasses? Well, polar optics by design offers users 360 degree protection. The polar optics covers the entire user's fovea. Thus, no matter where you look or move, polar optics will protect you. Polar optics can also be personalized, so we can create it through free dimensional printing, thus catering to each individual user. All you have to do is go to an optometrist or eye clinician once, get your measurements, type them into our website, and have your own pair of polar optics sent to your doorstep in five working days. And better yet, we offer a range of degrees of polarization, so your optometrist might recommend that you're more sensitive, so you can get darker polarization, whereas if you're less sensitive, you can opt for lighter versions. And finally, there is no health and safety code that states that you cannot wear polar optics in the workplace, which goes to show that people from all walks of life can use polar optics. Now that we've established theory, being the businessman I am, let's make this a reality. I proceeded to contact the procurement management team of five leading international contact lens manufacturers around the globe to gain a better understanding of the underlying costs associated with producing polar optics. From this research, I found that a base manufacturing cost for polar optics is five New Zealand dollars. Taking in other underlying costs, there is approximately 15 New Zealand dollars per pair. Thus today, I'm excited to announce that polar optics will have a launch price of 35 New Zealand dollars per pair. Each of these pairs will typically last at one month. Thus, if you were looking for a full year, that's 480 New Zealand dollars. Our goal is to reach 10 to 15 percent market penetration within the Australasian market. We have forecasted that's 15,000 users, both in Australia and New Zealand that suffer from light sensitivity, and that is a conservative estimate. Following a standard market penetration curve, we want to reach full market penetration within a five-year period, reaching 50%. Based on these prices, we will also reach within the first two years $1.8 million in profit, based on these 15,000 users. Now that we've established economic, scientific, and environmental factors, it's important we don't lose sight of what truly matters. And what truly matters is social factors. In the words of Kofi Annan of the United Nations, it is my aspiration that health finally will not be seen as a blessing to be wished for, but as a human right to be fought for. And I believe this embodies polar optics vision and purpose as a company, as we want to provide vision health to people from all walks of life. With that said, we are going to dedicate one free pair of polar optics for every 10 pairs sold in New Zealand. All a user has to do is simply go onto our website and state why they need polar optics and how it can improve their lives. Thus, by supporting our company, you're actually supporting a person who need, who direly needs polar optics. We also want to take this to the next level to provide true social justice. So we're going to partner with the Fred Hollows Foundation, which specialise in eye clinician and optometry in third world countries. So we're going to go and we're going to set up three-dimensional printers in these countries so they can produce their own form of contact lenses and polar optics virtually free of charge. I believe polar optics is embodied by a quote by Sir Paul Callaghan in his final speech of Zealandia before he sadly passed away. 
It's hard to make a difference living in New York, but here, in New Zealand, everything you contribute makes a visible difference. And in that way, that is why launching Polar Optics in New Zealand is so amazing, as we're an immensely innovative country, and if it works here, chances are it will work anywhere. At the beginning of this presentation, I invited you to share my dream with me, a dream to provide visual health care to people from all walks of life, irrespective of gender, sexual orientation, religion, race, and culture. Health is something that connects us all and provides meaning to our lives. I invite you to share my dream with me. Polar optics, polarized contact lenses. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Logan. Um, how, how does the polarization actually work in the contact lenses? Okay, so what you start with is discs. So when you're making a three-dimensional printer, and these discs are polarized. Okay, so it's the filaments that make up the disc that bend the light. That's how polarization works. Of course, sense. your friend could wear ski goggles, and that would answer yep. the issue, Perfect. right? Good example. Um, and from a business perspective, you're absolutely right. There are definitely alternatives, but 50% of people that need glasses in general also opt for contact lenses. And that just goes to show that there's actually a desire for a contact lens offering in the marketplace, I believe. So how would they function uh, for night vision? For night vision as well. Um, so typically, most you probably wouldn't need them for light sensitivity if it's night time because there's no. No, but you light. put your contact lenses in, you leave them there till you go to bed as a rule. Oh right, right, yes, yes. Um, so it would go back to being able to personalise your own care. You go into a dark room, care. you go into an elevator, anything. Yeah, you're 100% you're right. Dim light. So you can personalise your own pair of polar optics. So we can opt for a lighter version. So if you went for a lighter version of polar optics, it really wouldn't hinder your your eyesight at all. But if you period. went for a lighter version, then you wouldn't have one of the relatively extreme problems that you've been citing. Yeah, yeah, you're 100% right. Um, mm -hmm. But to some extent, the lighter version of polar optics still improves health. You don't need the darker one necessarily. For instance, with Kim, she doesn't need the darkest form. The lighter one would be perfectly sufficient to stop headaches and migraines. Um, it, given the levels of water pollution and contamination through world <laughs> countries, prescribing contact lenses might seem to be a, a risky gambit. Yes, I do see that. Environmental factors is definitely a major consideration. Um, but in fact, one of my companies is dedicated to doing that, and that's Biome. Um, I think we need to take Dedicated to doing what? Oh, from last year's presentation, I convert Didymo to paper, plastic, and fabric. Thank and, you. Yeah, it's now a company, sorry. Um, and we want to have a pure focus on environment. We're going to do everything possible to make sure there's no pollution from the production. And three-dimensional printing typically doesn't have too many pollutants associated with it, so don't neglect it. Thanks, Logan. Thank you.